start with prenatal diagnosis. Currently, the most common anorectal malformation that is diagnosed prenatally is the cloaca. The reason is because there are many associated anomalies. So if we think about a cloaca, 60% of them will have duplication of the Mullerian structures, two hemivagina, two hemiuteri. And if we think about hydrocopos, these combinations of duplication of Mullerian structures in hydrocopos makes the prenatal diagnosis of a cloaca easy. I think we are evolving and hopefully by the next uh, pediatric surgery review course, we'll be able to tell that we are diagnosing almost all of them because it is possible. The problem is that it's not part of the anatomic uh, screening, at least in the United States, to look for the anus. So that's why we miss so many, but hopefully we'll change that soon. So if we look at this coronal image, we can see the dilated bowel entering in between two distended hemivaginas. And the classic image is the one on this side when we have an axial cut and we can see the bladder in front, the two hemivaginas filled with fluid behind, and the bowel entering in between both hemivaginas. Rarely we're gonna do anything prenatal. So mainly the diagnosis is important for counseling the parents so they can, for example, deliver in a hospital that there is a pediatric surgical team familiar with cloaca. Unfortunately, still nowadays, uh, mothers deliver babies with an anorectal malformation. They were unaware that the baby was coming with an anorectal malformation. The baby has to be transferred to another hospital to receive care. The father doesn't know if he stays with the mom, if he goes with the baby, and it's a very traumatic situation. And the parents always report that to us. So hopefully this will soon change. Once the baby is born, what we need to do is of course a very good physical exam confirming that it's a case of anorectal malformation. But then before we think about taking the patient to the operating room, we must exclude all associated anomalies. First and most importantly, the heart. 30% of the patients with anorectal malformation will have a cardiac anomaly. Only 10% of them will be hemodynamically important. But before putting the patient under anesthesia, we need to know if there is a cardiac condition. About 50% of the patients will have an associated urological anomaly. So hydronephrosis is one of them, uh, absent kidney. So we always want a kidney ultrasound. We wanna exclude esophageal atresia that happens in about 8% of the cases and duodenal atresia about 5% of the cases. We normally recommend doing a baby gram where we're gonna be able to see for, like in this example, a double bubble, and also if the patient has hemivertebra, like in this case. But very importantly, we need the sacral x-ray, AP and lateral. So the AP will show us, like in this case, if there is a sacral defect, a hemisacral that would indicate that there is a presacral mass. Now, if you have a sacral defect, you don't have to think about sacral ratio because the prognosis for bowel control will not be good. And if you see a sacral defect, then you are obligated to order an MRI because this patient will probably have a presacral mass. Now, if you don't see a sacral defect, then we're gonna calculate the sacral ratio because this will tell us the future prognosis for bowel control. The way we do it, we first draw a line in the direction of the sacrum, another line at the top of the iliac crest, 
the next line at the sacroiliac junction, and the last line at the last bone that you can see of the sacrum. If it's a normal sacrum, it will be the coccyx. And then you're gonna divide the distance between the second and the third line with the first and the second line. If you find a value of 0 0.7 or above, this is a sacrum that carries good prognosis for bowel control. If you find a, a value of 0 0.4 or below, from day one of life, you know that this patient will not have bowel control. And it's important to share this information with the parents to avoid future unnecessary suffering. So there's no good moment to give bad news, but if you prepare the parents and you explain that you will be there and you can provide bowel management for the fecal incontinence, they will feel better. The reason why we do the AP and the lateral is because only in the AP we would be able to see a sacral defect. But if you have different values from the AP and the lateral view, the lateral view is the preferred one. The reason is the sacral may have different angles. So in an AP, it may give the false impression that it's a short sacrum, but in the lateral, you will see the right uh, length. But the landmarks are exactly the same. So we're gonna draw a line in the direction of the sacrum, one on the top of the iliac crest, sacroiliac junction, and the last bone that you can see. Divide the distance between BC for AB, value 0 0.7 good, below 0 0.4 fecal incontinence. We're also gonna ask for a spinal ultrasound. 25% of the patients have tetracord, meaning that the conus medullaris is below the level of L2. And in babies that are born with a cloaca, we wanna do a pelvic ultrasound to rule out hydrocopos. So the hydrocopos will be seen in the pelvic ultrasound as a cystic mass that has two characteristic fluids, usually urine and mucus. And you have to tell the radiologist that you're specific looking for a cystic mass behind the bladder. What's gonna determine the final prognosis for the bowel control is the type of anorectal malformation sacral ratio, presence, absence of tetracord, and that you have performed a technically correct operation. As a pediatric surgeon, that's our responsibility. So now we're gonna go through all the types of anorectal malformation. The first one and the most benign, the one that often is missed, uh, is the rectal perineal fistula. So in this anomaly, as you can see, the rectum is almost within the, the muscle complex, just in the most distal portion, it is anterior to the center of the sphincter. Now in the male patient, it's important to always remember the proximity with the urethra during the surgical repair. Dr. Pena will go into details about how to avoid injury to the urethra. And in the female patient, even though in this diagram it shows as it was very separate from the vagina, it is not. So you have to be careful not to injure the vagina. The best way to examine the patient is to pull the labia towards you, and then you're gonna be able to see all the orifice, urethra, vagina, in this case, the rectal perineal fistula and the center of the sphincter. So in a rectal perineal fistula with normal sacrum, no tetracord and a good operation, these patients have a 100% chance of bowel control. So when you think about your responsibility during an operation, that's the one you have to worry the most because these patients are born with a very good prognosis for bowel control 
And we cannot be responsible for changing this prognosis. But if we have a complication and the patient needs a reoperation, the prognosis for bowel control is not the same. So the next malformation that it's the most common malformation in female patients is the rectal vestibular fistula. So as you can see in this diagram, the rectum opens in the vestibule of the vagina. And in this case, it shares a common wall with the vagina. So in this malformation, the surgeon has to be very meticulous during the separation of the rectum from the vagina because we are making two walls out of one. When we have a normal sacrum, no tetracord, good operation, these patients have 95% chance of bowel control. So it's still a very good anomaly in terms of prognosis for bowel control. Again, once the baby is born, you wanna have good light, you wanna have someone holding the legs almost in a lithotomy position. You're gonna pull the labia to try to identify the orifice. The genitalia sometimes is very edematous, so it's hard to see, but you have to suspect if you don't see. So in this case, the urethra is here. You can see that the hymen is a little prolapsed, and you know that the rectal vestibular fistula is exactly in the midline right behind the vagina. So if you cannot see it, you can just ask for an eight French feeding tube, pass the catheter, inject a little bit of saline, pull back. If you see meconium, you made the diagnosis of a rectal vestibular fistula. You can see why people confuse this very often with a rectal vaginal fistula because they see the meconium coming from that area but this is not a rectal vaginal fistula, this is a rectal vestibular fistula. Rectal vaginal fistula is a very unusual malformation, extremely rare, and in those cases, the rectum opens in the posterior wall of the vagina. The next malformation is the imperforate anus without fistula. For an unknown reason, this is very common in patients with trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. And even when there is no communication with the urinary tract during the dissection, you have to remember that it's very close to the urethra. The separation from the urethra must be done very carefully. It's not an easier malformation because there is no fistula, because the common wall is still there. So this malformation also carries good prognosis for bowel control, about 80 to 90% chances of bowel control, provided you have normal sacrum and no tetracord. In patients with trisomy 21, the, the level of uh, underdeveloped is what will uh, affect bowel control. So some patients are very well developed, others not so well, and those patients will have um, not so good bowel control. Then comes the most common malformation on male patients, that it's the rectal urethral bulbar fistula. So in this anomaly, the rectum opens at the level of the bulbar fistula. There is a long common wall with the urethra. When the patient has normal sacrum, no tetracord, receives a good operation, 85% chance of bowel control. And every time I say that a patient with an erectile malformation has good chances for bowel control, you have to remember those patients are the ones that are gonna suffer from the worst type of constipation. So here you can see the perineum, when you examine, you obviously don't know exactly which type we're dealing, but if you see a well-formed perineum, a good midline groove, a well-located center of the sphincter, you can imagine exactly where the anus should be located. This speaks more towards a malformation with good prognosis. Now, the rectal urethral prostatic fistula, so in this one, the rectum opens at the level of the prostatic urethra, 
this is not a very good malformation in terms of bowel control. Only 65% of the patients will have bowel control. And in this case, you see that the perineum is not as well formed as the previous picture. We can still see a midline groove, but you see that the center of the sphincter is not as well formed as the previous case. And the highest type of anorectal malformation in male patients are um, rectal bladder neck fistula. So in this one, uh, the prognosis for bowel control is not good. Only 15% of the patients will have bowel control. And this is the only malformation in which the rectum will not be found posterior sagittally. So in order to separate the rectum from the urinary tract, we will have to go through the abdomen, either through laparoscopy or laparotomy. And when we look at the perineum, we're going to see a more flat bottom. You can see that the midline is not so well defined. And when we use the electrical stimulator, we will see that the center of the sphincter is very close to the scrotum. So that speaks to us that we are dealing with a high malformation, probably a rectal urethral bulbar fistula. And in females, uh, we have a little girl that is born with a single perineal orifice. That's the diagnosis of a cloaca. And we can have a short common channel when they have normal sacrum and a common channel less than three centimeters. About 75% of the patients will have bowel control. Now, when we have a long common channel, the majority of the patients do not have bowel control and they will need bowel management with enemas to stay clean in the underwear. So again, you examine, you pull the labia, you see a single orifice, you made the diagnosis. Now, once you made the diagnosis, you excluded all the associated anomalies, then it's time to think about taking the patient to the operating room. We, in our courses, discusses, discuss a lot about primary repair, primary delayed repair, or colostomy. And the decision has to do with several factors, including your experience, the, the surrounding circumstances, do you have a good anesthesiologist, do you have a good neonatal unit to take care of this patient, and the conditions of the baby. Is this a newborn, uh, healthy, three kilos, no associated anomalies, or it is a 1.5 kilo that has a cardiac condition. So all this has to play into the decision between colostomy, delayed primary repair or primary repair. Of course, the only patients that can have a delayed primary repair without a colostomy are the rectal perineal fistulas and uh, the rectal vestibular fistulas. All the others will have to decide between a colostomy and um, or a primary repair. Uh, if you decide to do a colostomy, the colostomy that we recommend is a descending colostomy. The reason is, if you remember, the descending colon is attached to the abdominal wall. So as soon as we see it free, that's where we make our stoma that will avoid prolapse. And then in the mucus fistula, that since the sigmoid is mobile, we make it tiny uh, so we don't have prolapse. And that allows to have enough distal bowel for our future pull through. We want the stomas to be separated so there is no contamination of stool from the proximal stoma to the distal stoma. And very important, when we open the colostomy, we want to completely clean the distal bowel so there is no contamination of the urinary tract. Once we have the colostomy, then we can plan for the most important study, that is the high pressure distal colostogram. Let me see if it works, it seems that it's working. The way we do it, we insert a Foley catheter into the mucus fistula, inflate the balloon, pull back to act as a plug, and we're gonna inject contrast. 
We will always stop at this level because of the muscle tone. We keep injecting until we overcome the muscle tone. And then we're gonna fill the bladder. We're gonna see exactly the location of the fistula. And if we keep injecting, the patient will void and we have the perfect distal colostogram. When you're doing the distal colostogram, you have to tell the radiologist that you need to see the entrance of the mucous fistula. You need to see the sacrum. You need an anal marker at the anal dimple so you can see the whole pitch, picture. And you're gonna plan, if I enter posterior sagittally, am I gonna find the rectum? Do I have enough bowel for the pull through? And this will help you to plan for the surgery. So from colostomy closure or from reconstruction, until the toilet training age, we should manage the constipation. Remember that the constipation is very common in patients with anorectal malformation, but for the, also in patients that suffer from fecal incontinence. And you remember that when we are born, we're all in diapers. So even if the baby um, is fecal incontinent, at the beginning, this is all normal. We don't have to worry. Now, for patients that have good prognosis for bowel control, we're gonna treat them with laxatives. For patients that have poor prognosis for bowel control, when it's the age that other kids are out of diapers, we want our kids to be out of diapers too. So we're gonna start them on a formal enema program to leave them artificially clean for uh, 24 hours. For the laxatives, we determine the amount of laxatives needed on daily basis to empty the colon radiologically demonstrated. I cannot overemphasize the importance of the abdominal radiograph to see if the constipation is being well managed or not. In most patients with anorectal malformation, they also need fiber besides the laxatives to bulk the stool. So if you give them laxatives and they start having liquid stool, they will not be able to feel. They need that right consistency to fill the stool, even the patients with good prognosis for bowel control. So the way we do the bowel management is very simple. We use a Foley catheter uh, and we're gonna insert into the anus. Again, we inflate the balloon and we're gonna pull back to act as a plug. And then we're gonna infuse the solution between five and 10 minutes. We ask the patients to hold the solution at least five minutes. Then we deflate the balloon. They're gonna sit in the toilet for 45 minutes. So the whole process is one hour. And our goal with an enema is to clean the rectum and the descending colon because the stool in the right column takes about 24 hours to reach the rectum. And that's how we keep them artificially clean for a stool in the underwear. And what they do is they start, I know it sounds like one hour is, is a lot, but parents and patients are very creative and they use this time either for nowadays electronics, which is something many kids love to do, or homework, reading, and they end up incorporating in their routine without problems. What is the recipe of the enema? The base of the enema is normal saline, and the irritants of the enema are liquid glycerin, castile soap, and phosphate. We leave the fleet as our last resource. And again, what we are trying to do is compare the abdominal radiograph. So here you can see uh, this granulation is the characteristic appearance of the stool. This patient is completely full of stool, same patient. And now you can see that the rectum is clean, the left colon is clean, even the transverse is clean. There is just a little bit of stool in the ascending column. So the only way to know either if your laxative dose is adequate 
or if your enema is cleaning the colon, it's by looking at the abdominal radiograph. That will tell you what you have to do next. So once we have determined that the patient needs enemas for life, that that's the treatment for him or her to be clean, and they have been doing retrograde enemas, so through the rectum, then we can offer a more independent way to do enemas, that is the antegrade enema procedure. We like to do Malone, where we connect the appendix to the umbilicus. That way the patient will sit in the toilet, pass a number eight French feeding tube, connect the bag, give himself or herself an enema, and be done for the day. We always emphasize that the Malone is not the treatment for fecal incontinence. The treatment for fecal incontinence is finding the right enema recipe. The undergrade enema procedure is just a door for administration of the enema. And it's not true that the undergrade flush is better than the rectal enema. They work exactly the same. So for some patients, the appendix has been used, for example, for a Mitrofenov, or like in old school, when I went to medical school, I learned that if we enter the abdomen of a child, we should always remove the appendix. I think nowadays, this is not the rule anymore, but sometimes we are faced with a child that does not have the appendix. So in those cases, we create an appendix and we do it with a colonic flap. So the way we do it is we identify a good blood supply, then we mark uh, with our bovi where we are gonna raise the flap. So here you can see we already raised the flap. Then we insert an eight French feeding tube. Then we're gonna close the colon and close the flap on top of this tube. Then we are gonna lay down this new appendix in the column so we create a valve-like mechanism to avoid leakage of stool. And then we are gonna anastomose the tip of this new appendix to the belly button. So that's how we do um, the new appendix. And I think when we are treating with patients with anorectal malformation, we wanna do it in a multidisciplinary way. So we are very fortunate here to work with a very good urologist, very good gynecologist, very good neurosurgeon, nephrologist, because this is truly a teamwork. And, um, and the patients benefit from this team approach. And then comes um, the new area that we've been talking about, that is transition of care. So, uh, sorry. So our patients are growing and we started receiving phone calls almost on daily basis that our patient was in an adult hospital with, for example, a bowel obstruction. And the adult surgeon was not comfortable managing our patients and they didn't wanna operate on them or a patient with anorectal malformation was interested in fertility and the, the obstetricians were not comfortable on treating that patient. So we moved to Denver with the idea to create a transition of care uh, program so our patients could receive care all life because even when, uh, we have arbitrarily decided that there is this division, the sequela continues and the patients need our care. I want to ask questions, refer, uh, come here, uh, ask us technical questions, send us pictures, clinical histories, we'll be happy to, to answer. We are here to help you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Pino, for your presentation. Uh, really excellent presentation from the most expert in the field of colorectal. Uh, it's our pleasure to have you. We have multiple questions in the question and answer uh, section. So I'll take uh, the questions one by one. Uh, we have a question from uh, Mustafa Qasim. He's asking about uh, 
uh, that he has a 10 years old girl in the clinic uh, who has never attained bowel control. No examination. On examination, it's not an obvious retroperitoneal fistula. Uh, is there any investigation imaging or contrast accurately to diagnose a anterior displaced anus or uh, the only solution is examination under anesthesia and anal mapping? So uh, the question is about a 10 years old girl uh, that apparently suffers from possible fecal incontinence. And um, the doctor is asking if there is a way that this could be a rectoperineal fistula. So I'm just gonna first start saying that rectoperineal fistula, if they have a normal sacrum, even without operation, they have a 100% chance of bowel control. So this patient needs an abdominal x-ray, a sacral x-ray, and examination to see the caliber of the anus. Without seeing the patient, it's very hard to comment, but chances are that this patient suffers from constipation, that it's not being well treated, and overflow pseudo incontinence. Uh, but in order to know if this is a rectoperineal fistula, you would find a smaller caliber anterior to the center of the sphincter. So a newborn anus should accommodate a number 12 Hager. So in a 10 years old, she should be able to accommodate a number 17 Hager. If she doesn't, she probably has a rectoperineal fistula. But again, most likely she needs constipation management. Super. The other questions from uh, Arwa Rigari, she's asking uh, what she can do if the mucus fistula retracted or disappeared from the skin at the time of doing the uh, distal lupogram. So yes. we cannot find the opening. So. so if that happens, the patient needs a revision because you need access to the mucus fistula to do the distal colostogram. So if the mucus fistula has closed, the patient will need a small revision to open. And at that same uh, operation, I would leave the folly already inside and take the patient and do the distal colostogram on that same day. Super. I have an, like other question. They're asking about the doses of the laxative. Uh, you mentioned the uh, con uh, the continent of the uh, laxative, it's phosphate, I think, and you said the glycerin and castor. No. So that's for the enemas. Okay. Enemas, we use normal saline between 200 ml and 1,000 ml, and the irritants are liquid glycerin. We use between 10 ml up to 80 ml. Uh, Castile soap, that it's a very mild hand soap, we use between 10 ml to 60 ml. And the fleet, we use according to the patient's age. So a patient that is between two and four years of age, we only use half of a pediatric fleet, 33 ml. Between four and 10 years of age, we use a pediatric fleet, 66 ml. And above 10 years of age, we use an adult fleet, 133 ml. Laxatives, our preference in United States, there is a brand that it's called X-Lax, that it's Senna based. And there is no limit, it's trial and error. We have patients in elephant dosage, and with that dosage, they are fine, they still every day and they are cleaning the underwear. So don't confuse enemas with laxatives. Enemas are for patients that are fecal incontinent, laxatives are for patients with constipation and bowel control. Super, uh, I have another question. Uh, actually, uh, they're asking, uh, do you send the uh, distal rectal tissue for histopathology or no? Do you wanna answer this? Mm -hmm. If you send the distal rectum for pathology. For, for many years, actually for 20 years, I keep sending those little specimens to pathology. And um, these results were all confusing. Sometimes they found ganglion cells, some, sometimes they found no ganglion cells, sometimes they have disorganized uh, structures, but they, they had no clinical implication. No, we don't make diagnosis of Hirschsprung disease by sending those little pieces. By the way, 
the people that send that, that histology, sometimes, sometimes because they want to rule out Hirschsprung disease. The association of Hirschsprung disease with anal rectal malformation is extremely rare. I'm going to repeat, it's extremely rare. Now, the number of cases that we receive with anal rectal malformation suffering from constipation misdiagnosed as Hirschsprung are many. Because the surgeons, we, when we see a constipated patient, we think in Hirschsprung disease. Well, it's extremely, we have, I think we have right. seen four cases in, in, we're talking about 40 years and, and more than like 3,500 cases. So and there's a lot of cases that the surgeons suspected and misdiagnosed Hirschsprung, but real Hirschsprung associated is very, very unusual. So we no longer send those little pieces of, uh, uh, we did it also for research, right? Yeah. Oh, super. I have another question. They're asking about, um, just a minute. Uh, yes, uh, for mucosal prolapse after PSAR procedure, uh, how can we manage it? Well, go ahead. The, the, the prolapse um, happens more often the higher the malformation. Happens more often in patients with poor sphincters. So if you have prolapse in a patient with normal sacrum, good sphincters, rectal ureter, vulva fistula, or perineal fistula, that is consecutive to mismanagement. It means something was done wrong. Excessive dissection, like what happens in laparoscopy in cases of rectal ureter, vulva fistula may produce prolapse. Now, when the patient comes with prolapse, if the prolapse is minimal and does not interfere with the quality of life of the patient, we just watch him and avoid constipation. The prolapse is interfering with the quality of life. In other words, the patient complains, is passing mucus, bleeds because of the contact of the underwear, and um, so he's very unhappy, we operate. So we used to just to perform a resection of the extra tissue that comes out and redo the anoplasty. But then Two years ago, we joined as Dr. Luis de la Torre. Dr. Luis de la Torre is the person who designed the operation called um, um, submucosal dissection for the transanal operation for the treatment of Hirschsprung disease. And he came up with a great idea about the treatment of prolapse. The person who is asking that can look in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery when was that? I don't remember. Journal of Pediatric Surgery, and one is, the technique is published with beautiful diagrams. I don't have here the diagrams to show you, but we are very happy with that technique. And really, we recommend that. I encourage everybody who is listening to this to look into that publication to see how ingenious is the procedure. And we have seen much better results than what we used to, see, to do to see with a simple anoplasty. Uh, super. I'll take two more questions. Uh, the uh, one is asking, how do you manage urethral injury during PSARP? How do you manage urethral injury during PSARP? <laughs> so we don't have urethral injuries during, the, during PSARP, but we have many cases that were operated and had urethral injuries. The urethral injuries go from total section of the urethra Patients operated without a polycatheter. The urethra in a baby is a very delicate structure and the surgeons, particularly in rectal perineal fistulas, is, don't, do not underestimate any case with anorectal malformation. Patients with the rectal perineal fistula operated, you, have, you need a polycatheter. And when you dissect the anterior rectal wall, you must keep thinking in the urethra. So we have seen cases referred to us in which the surgeon completely divided the urethra. For that, we re-operate, we do a posterior approach and re-anastomose the urethra. And uh, if there was no further damage to the innervation of the bladder, those patients have urinary control. But, but th those complications should never happen because the patients came with a minor, minor uh, problem. We also have seen patients in which the surgeons divided the urethra, did not find the rectum, opened posterior sites that are without a distal colostogram, could not find the rectum, divided the urethra, they thought that with no foley cutter, they thought it was a rectum and pulled the bladder down, thinking that it was the, the rectum. So for those cases, those are tragic cases. We have to reoperate, put things together, and, um, and, and 
and, the, and tell the parents that the patient would not have urinary control, most likely. Uh, super. I'll go to other questions. Okay, how do you prevent, uh, we said this, uh, does total urogenital mobilization affect urinary incontinence? Can you repeat the question? Does total urogenital mobilization affect urinary continence? Oh, if total urogenital mobilization affects urinary continence. If you if you try to if you try to pull down the urogenital sinus in a patient with a common channel longer than three centimeters, you keep pulling and pulling. Eventually, you will bring everything down, and the patient is going to be incontinent. Yes. So misuse of the total urogenital mobilization yes produces urinary incontinence. If you use the total urogenital mobilization for cases of less than three centimeters and don't pull too much, the patients have urinary control. With okay. heavy, assuming the patient has normal sacrum and not testicular. Super. I have another question. Uh, how do you avoid and manage recurrent uh, rectourethral fistula? So how to avoid, I think Dr. Pena already emphasized the importance of the Foley catheter and following the steps that he just demonstrated in how to do a posterior sagittal approach. The re recurrence of a rectal ureter fistula may happen. Uh, we had many cases like that that were referred to us. When you look at the operative report, the surgeons mobilize the rectum left the, the rectum under tension in the anastomosis, did not mobilize the rectum enough, or devascularize the rectum, they have ischemic distal rectum, or they, um, or they did not mobilize the rectum enough, and they left sutures in the rectum in front of the sutures of the urethra, and the fistula reopens. Super. I have another question asking about uh, the most suitable age for a PCR procedure. So we don't have a cutoff age for us uh, if we did not decide for a primary repair. It's important that we see that the patient is growing well. So once we see that the patient is growing well, we can do it at one month, two months. Uh, we prefer to do it sooner rather than later. Uh, we don't want the patient to have memories of the procedure. Okay. Uh... There's a lot of questions about the anterior, uh, anteriorly displaced anus. What is the management in those cases? So we don't believe that we, oh, let's put it that way. We have never seen an anterior displaced anus. What we have seen is rectoperineal fistula. In those cases, the caliber is smaller and it's not completely surrounded by sphincter. We have never seen a completely surrounded sphincter, normal caliber that it's located um, anterior. So many of these patients are just truly rectoperineal fistulas or just constipation. That's our impression. Yes, he, he, so, a member of the, of, the, of the audience has seen or believes that has seen a case with anterior anus, anterior anus, I suggest him to measure the caliber, to look inside, and in order to make that such a diagnosis, we have never seen a case like that, they should see a normal caliber anus surrounded by 100%, 360 degrees by sphincter, demonstrated electrically, and with a pectinate line inside. If you see something like that, please send us the, the information, including good photographs because that would be a unique case that I have never seen in my life. Now, on the other hand, we have seen many, but many, many cases that came to us with the diagnosis of anterior anus and have a perineal fistula. Super. I've uh, got uh, one more question regarding the role of cesarean section in anorectal malformation uh, patient in the future. Can you repeat the question? The role of cesarean section, if a female patient had an anorectal malformation post PSARP, what is the role of the uh, cesarean section in the future or she can deliver it normally? Yeah, so currently for rectoperineal fistulas or rectovestibular fistulas in which the operation was done correctly, 
we advise vaginal delivery. For cloaca patients, we advise cesarean section. Super, and then there's, the, I'll take this last question. Uh, they're asking about the anastomosis of the anterior wall of the distal rectum, which has only mucosa, not full thickness, as you mentioned in your presentation. So uh, do you anastomose it like only mucosa or like a full, thickening, full thickness uh, bowel? No, um, the, um, um, is this, that's a very good question. The, um, actually, when we, once we finish mobilizing the mobilization of the rectum down to do the anoplasty, we actually suture full thickness rectum in the anoplasty. The, the, that part that, that had only mucosa is usually resected at the time of the anoplasty. We don't suture just mucosa to the skin. We don't do that. Super. Uh... Okay, there is this question uh, asking about, did you face normally deviated muscle complex or it, like usually medline should be free or uh, our plane, like? Sorry, we didn't understand the question. Uh, actually, he's asking, did you face a normally de deviated muscle complex? So usually we go through the medline, but uh, I think what I understand from the question, can we go through the midline and go through muscles? Or no, usually midline is the line where nothing crossing. So I, I'm going to try to interpret the question. Sometimes the patient has a lipoma, for example, when the muscles are deviated. Yes. So ideally, we want to have a mirror image. So you want to go through the, this dissection and have the same amount of muscle in one side, the same amount of fat in one side and the other. Sometimes this is not exactly in the midline when you have a lipoma, for example. I, I, I hope I answered the question. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, okay. When do you decide to redo operation for PSARP for incontinent patient? That's a very good question. So I'm going to comment and Dr. Peña is going to comment too because this is very, very important. So as I mentioned, patients are born with a certain prognosis for bowel control. So if you do a correct operation or if someone else did an operation and you find a minor mislocation, those patients do not improve. So there are indications for reoperation because of catastrophes, because uh, the patient has a persistent fistula, because the patient has a severe prolapse, uh, or anatomical problems, but to improve bowel control, very, very few patients would truly benefit for a reoperation. So the ideal indication is when the rectum is completely away from the center of the sphincter, but the center of the sphincter was not touched. The patient has the entire bowel, meaning that they did not remove portions of the bowel, and the patient has a normal sacrum. That would be the only formal indication to attempt a reoperation to improve bowel control. And even in those perfect circumstances, only 50% of the patients would uh, improve bowel control. Now you have to remember, reoperations are harder, chances of complications are higher. So in an attempt to improve the patient, you can make the patient worse than what it came to you. So. Our advice, only reoperate if there are formal indications for it. Improve bowel control, it rarely happens. So actually, many years ago, when I started doing the posterior structure approach, I was so enthusiastic that I reoperated every patient that came to me that had a previous operation and suffered from incontinence. I was very optimistic, and very soon I learned the lesson. And I warn you, there are many enthusiastic surgeons uh, professors who believe in those operations, and based on our experience, though, they don't improve. Minor mislocations of the anus. Don't, if you put it back in the, in the believing that it's going to prevent bowel control, they are not going to believe. And worse even, already Dr. Bishop said that, if the patient comes with a poor sacrum, it's a contraindicated to try to reoperate to bowel control because he was born with a bad prognosis, prognosis to begin with. If the, patient, if the original operation included resection of the rectum, 
You no, know, never try to improve those patients because they would never improve. Patients with anorectal malformation that underwent the resection of the rectum in the original procedure will never have bowel control. Super, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question asking about, is there any acceptable normal distance between the vestibule and the anus? Uh, I would say the question is how much perineal body you should leave uh, in a female patient. We don't determine, we place the anus in the center of the sphincter and that's usually enough of a perineal body, but we are not measuring or determining. It's the electrical stimulation will show us where is the center of the sphincter. And if the question is referring to, to uh, the, the way to diagnose the so-called anterior anus, I think we already mentioned what we believe at that time. We don't believe in those indexes that measure the distance between the base of the scrotum and the anus and the coccyx and don't for, to determine whether the patient has an anterior anus or not. With that, we believe that that's, that, that, that doesn't exist, the so-called anterior anus. Super. And then someone is asking about the uh, anal dilatation postoperatively. Yes. So we always recommend uh, anal dilations postoperatively to avoid the natural healing process from closing the anus. So in a patient with a good prognosis for bowel control, once we finish the operation, the anus will be closed. So we teach the mothers how to do the dilation in clinic. They are not painful um, and they follow the protocol. If we don't do dilation, they will come back with a ring-like structure at the level of the skin and uh, I don't think it's ethically to put them under anesthesia multiple times. We don't believe in dilations under anesthesia because you overstretch uh, the area and then you cause minor lacerations that will heal again and this you're going to be fighting recurrence. So we believe dilations are really important. I'm, I'm going to emphasize what Dr. Bishop said. The, um, I have been in round, international roundtables discussing the indication or contraindications of anal dilatations. If you are the kind of surgeon that, that create anoplasties that look like a colostomy, the patient doesn't need dilatations. Okay? If you are a fine surgeon who performs repairs and at the end of the operation in a patient with good sphincter, with, an, with a rectum with good blood supply, at the end of the procedure, the anus looks close, like the case that I show you, don't, you better do dilatation because if you leave it like that, it's going to create a stricture because it remains closed. The anus is closed. It's closed by the effect of the sphincter. Those patients need dilatation. For those who believe that dilatations represent a tra psychological trauma and a drama for the family, yes, they do when, when, the, when the anoplasty was done badly, when the patient had ischemia of the rectum, uh, tension, and the patient is developing a real stricture. There is no way to make the, to dilate the anus. So the surge, every time the mother passes the, the dilator is terrible pain and terrible suffering. If you do a good operation, if the blood supply is good and the dilatations are going to upset the child, but they are not really painful. Now, again, if you do big anoplasties, then the patient doesn't need dilatation, but we don't do those anoplasties. Super, thank you very much. Uh, I think I would like to, to stop here for your time, uh, though I have a lot of questions. So can people send you the questions through the uh, uh, emails so you can answer? Of course, absolutely, yeah. Super. Then I'll, I'll just I'll post your uh, emails so they can uh, send whatever questions. Yeah, I will just uh, update Dr. Pena's email. I'll, I'll write in the chat. Super. Dr. Pina, Dr. Bischoff, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure having you here. Uh, hope to see you next time uh, in person. Uh, hope to see you in Saudi Arabia soon. And we were looking for more collaboration between us as a Saudi group of uh, pediatric surgery, pediatric residency program, pediatric surgery residency program, pediatric surgery fellowship program. Uh, with you guys, if we could send some uh, people to be trained like for uh, observation or uh, 
uh, elective rotation with you guys. It would be a great pleasure. And if we have any interesting cases, we'll uh, be happy to share it with you and to take your feedback. Uh, really, uh, it was a pleasure having you both. Uh, we really appreciate your time. Uh, I know uh, it's very difficult for you guys to squeeze us in your schedule. So uh, our sincere pressure, uh, pleasure from our, like, or the organizing committee. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, grateful presentation. Thank you for the knowledge uh, and hope to see you in the future. We thank all of all, of, all the members of our, our audience and we send our regards to all the, our multiple friends that we have in all the countries in the in Middle East. With our best regards, I hope you stay safe, be careful with the virus, and look forward to see you again in your own country. Or if you come here, it would be a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, everybody. Real pleasure. Again, my apologies for missing the correct date, uh, but I'm glad we could reschedule and do this lecture. And again, we look forward to see you. We, we have been in Saudi Arabia multiple times, and we really enjoy all of our visits. Thank you. You made it. You made our day. So no need to apologize. Thank you very much. And I would like uh, to thank all the attendee. I would like to thank my colleagues, my uh, the uh, organizing committee. Uh, I would like to thank Jalfar, our uh, sponsoring today. So thank you very much, and hope to see you soon in the near future. And stay safe. This was your host today, Abdelaziz Banaja. Thank you very much and see you soon. Thank you. Bye.